one male side called Black and White. Do you still have graphics? simply three pages of, of material for the purpose of talking. What is he like? Name, Rem Stokes. Born Greenville, South Carolina. Educated, Clemson College, Butler University. Degrees in mechanical engineering and psychology. And what are the problems associated with each of these things? Um, we also need those studies to supplement this thing. So As an engineer here at Bell Laboratories, I worked on a variety of projects, uh, from the single slot coin telephone to the boost that it goes into to the laminate coins that go in the telephone. So let's include PBXs or coin telephones. I've worked on telephones which use cards for dialing right to the picture phone set. If we, yeah, excuse me. Hi, My Bill. boss is Bill Cagle. Oh, He's a straightforward guy that I feel very comfortable with. I get a good, earthy, Oklahoman-type feeling when I relate to Bill. He's the kind of boss that shares in your problems as well as your successes. I first met Bill when we were both right out of college. He used to kid that when he first went into engineering, his grandfather thought he was going to be driving a train. You know, a lot of people still don't know what engineers do. It's true, a lot of engineers still build dams and bridges and put up buildings. Uh, but more and more, we want to be sure that our designs meet the needs of people and meet the needs of society collectively. In other words, engineers today uh, serve as a bridge between the things that are discovered and how they may be put to practical use for the needs of people. I find this particularly important in the area of communications where I work, where we design and try to perfect items uh, for the use of people so they can relate to each other better, whether it be across the nation or right here in one room. I've always been fascinated with people especially in a relaxed, casual atmosphere where we have a freewheeling exchange of ideas. Uh, in the laboratory, ideas are what we thrive on. It's our business. And you never know where the next great idea is going to come from. And uh, each of our people here, whether they be a colleague from Sydney, Australia, or from South Korea, or Brooklyn, may produce the next good idea. Good. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hi, John. How are you doing? I was here the other day. You'd like to see what these liquid crystals can really be like. There are two types of displays and... Uh, Essentially, engineers are problem solvers. But the problems today are becoming increasingly more complex. And obviously, the answers are a lot less obvious than they ever were before. This means that we need to have people who are much more than technical mechanics. Our people need to have an appreciation for the human dimension in psychology, sociology, philosophy. Uh, the real test of an engineer today, I think, is whether he can design projects for his company which are profitable and safe, and whether they meet the real needs of people and the collective needs of the society. Between an on and off state. Well, why don't we put these in the human factors test? Uh, we have, you know, manpower ready to go right now. Anytime you want to run a test well, on this, that's, we can... that's what I thought we ought to get together. Now, a very simple trick that this particular manufacturer has used is providing a diffuser. We really want to get this modulator built into the cavity. We found that a good way of handling the problem. Engineering, like science, thrives on controversy. Inside the laboratory, there's a dynamic tension between people exploring ideas, and whether it be the light bulb or the transistor, engineers have found that one solution leads to another set of problems that we have to tackle gears worked out there so that we can move that thing in and out of the way the laser beam quite nicely. Right now we're investigating everything from voice transmission by laser to reducing roomfuls of equipment to thin film integrated circuits. The sky's literally not the limit anymore for communication. 
In the last 20 years, we've seen technology jump five times from relays to transistors to integrated circuits to lasers and now to fiber optics. And it just seems to constantly be changing. And in order to just keep up in a world like this, you're forever having to read and attend conferences and pick other people's brains more than we ever have before. Yeah, I'd prefer to have it mounted on, say, the back of this box. On Today, the idea of a Garrett inventor working alone is becoming a thing of the past. Most projects require engineers to work in teams, people with different disciplines, bringing them to focus on the same problem. Have you, have you had this thing down in the anticork chamber to uh, try the same no, thing? These, you can make a idea. much better judgment when you get down there and you get all these fans and everything. Yeah, oh, right. back, it's just designed, put it in that box. Oh, was that the... Uh, then, go, then go down to the anechoic mm -hmm. chamber and check it out. When it's what is that? Is, that, is that about the right size, do you think? Yeah, you walk yeah. Some projects we work on just simply are going to take years to get to the public because they're so complicated. And others may never get there at all, mind you. So you have to work very close on a project, and as it gets closer to reality, you grow to appreciate uh, the contributions of others and share in the satisfactions of their contributions to the project. Into here. Mm -hmm. Have you converted it to commercial components yet? No, that's the next that's step. We didn't, but we you're going to go ahead with the circuit you've got now. Right. right. They mostly use Are the camera guys right. going to do the same thing? Are they working pretty much yeah. on the same yeah. schedule? Yeah. Okay. It's a no. nice step up here. Very good. There were a couple of things that might be something that you guys might, uh, know something about. Engineers live in a very real world. They don't live in the ivy tower that a lot of people think they do. Our world is grounded in the realities of human needs, economics, and we live in a world of questions. Does the public need this? Can we do it cheaply? Can we do it safely? Is it compatible with the world we've created so far? Can we maintain this piece of equipment? Is there any need to do it at all? The more questions you ask, the better answers you're going to get. Engineers are generally concerned with producing something that large numbers of people like you can use. Now, once in a while, we have a chance to do something very special for people who are not quite like you. This is the voice control telephone. As you know, it's an experimental, self-contained, totally hands-free telephone intended for people that are unable to dial a telephone, or if they are able to dial a telephone, it's very difficult for them to do so. This is Marilyn. One of the real sincere joys for me is the elbow room you get in an organization like this to work on special projects once in a while like a phone for people who can't use their hands so they can dial it with their voice. They may not fit into anyone's big picture of what a business is for profitably and so forth, but they can bring much personal satisfaction to us, you know, as much so as having a brilliant or profitable scientific breakthrough. Okay. Again, you've got a traumatic quad as a result of an accident a couple of years ago. You can see the list on the, the left there is the telephone numbers of the people that hmm. have been calling, and it continues to grow, I understand, from kids. Yeah, it goes up goes to the ceiling. <laughs> when I'm home, if the wife goes out, I'm lost. Yeah. If anything happens, there's no way that I, I, I can't move. The, the voice control telephone exists, primarily because of my Greek colleague, Kitsch, said, why not? And in a remarkably short period of time, he and his group put together prototypes, got these things ready for a field trial, and put them out for people like Rich here to benefit from. But I don't want you to, to have any special worries, just... Uh, My initial goal as an engineer was to create new ideas, but now I'm finding myself taking a particular joy in seeing the people who work for me grow individually and coming up with solutions of their own. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, Hello, Bar. After a day of problem solving, when you've been successful, you feel very good. And then there are those other days when solutions elude you and you don't feel good at all. The tendency is to take these things home with you at night but I try not to do this too often. Personally, I prefer to sit around with some congenial friends and uh, change the subject. Have a pleasant evening. <laughs> Some people have the idea that engineers are stodgy or dull. 
Personally, they're people first and engineers second. And I find them a very high energy people, imaginative. And they have a special way of looking at the world, always trying to see it in its detail and understand it. And as a result of it, I find it very stimulating to be in conversation with them, on or off the job. <laughs> Stereotypes don't fit the engineers I know any more than they do other human beings. They're fathers and they're mothers. They have homes and they're concerned taxpayers. They want their children to grow up and have a better world than they had. And so they serve on PTAs and community chest and local school boards. We pay our taxes and we believe, as Justice Holmes said, that this is the price of civilization. Okay, hon, how about that racing turn there? Okay, let her come. There she comes. Like you, we don't believe that technology and engineering alone can guarantee the good life. But we do believe that if we are going to find answers to clean air and clean water, the problems of the energy crises, that the engineers will be part of this thing and that their minds will be essential to any solution that is worthy of the name. Mm -hmm.